Hello, this is the boring preface of a video that you don't like but I feel the need to do. If you want to see more of me or more content like this, it would encourage me and stimulate me if you like or comment or subscribe or all three of them. I just want to let you know that Albion has updates that change the meta and change stuff about how everything works. I will write in the description if this video is up to date and if there is a video with the updated information on my channel. All info that I will tell you here is in a guide that I wrote months ago. I will leave that in the description as well, but I have updated it many times. With that being said, I hope you enjoy and most importantly learn what you wanted to know. Welcome to Watergrip CVC Guides. First of all, I want to introduce myself, not only to show how great I am, but also show you where my context lies and where my experience lies. Hello, I'm Watergrip. I started Albion around Easter of 2020. This is around the time of the first lockdown. I started off in a potato farm guild, or I considered a potato farm, and later formed a small guild with some friends, just to be in the same guild. Three out of five friends stopped playing, so me and the guy that were left looked for a new guild. I then joined Mongol Kanate, where I learned 80% of all my game knowledge. I grew as a person and as a player, both fame-wise and skill-wise. I eventually started leading activities, later on got responsibilities, and eventually led ZVZs. I also had a role on the ZVZ officer team of the Alliance. After I left my guild, I called my home. I ventured and joined a couple of ZVZ focused guilds. Next off, I want to talk about the basic ZVZ questions. What, how, why, and when. First, let's start with what. ZVZ stands for Zurich vs Zurich. The word Zurich comes from the game Starcraft, made by Blizzard. Zurich is an alien race that has one singular unit controlling the whole race. At first this is the hive mind, later on this is the queen of blades. I would love to elaborate on the Starcraft story about Zurich, but I don't want to clutter this dog with too much info and I also don't want to spoil this Starcraft story. Anyway, the Zurich are often compared to ants because of their quantity, hierarchy, and efficiency. In the Zurich species, most units do not think for themselves. If you want more information on Zurich from StarCraft 2, check out their wiki. Okay, well, they're very cool, but what does this mean in Albion? To put it simple, we talk about Zergs when we want to say an army. Now, army sounds a bit too serious, and maybe that's why the community gave it a different name. We often talk about a Zerg when they have a full party or more. And we talk about ZVZ when two or more Zergs fight. Makes sense, right? Small scale ZVZ is often 25 versus 25. Mid scale often means 60 versus 60. And large scale ZVZ often means 150 plus versus 150 plus. Regardless of these small categorizations, we always refer to ZVZ as a whole as large scale PvP, starting from 20 plus versus 20 plus up to 175 versus 175. Next up, how. When making a Zerg, we divide them into parties. Each party has a maximum of 20 players. The composition of the party depends on the current meta, the objective, and preference of the shot caller. An average ideal composition will be 4 to 5 tanks, 3 to 4 supports, 4 healers, 2 to 4 melees, 3 to 7 ranged DPS. For party 1, one of the supports or tanks will, will also be the shot caller. The shot caller is the one that will lead the battle and guide the Zerg. A good way to show this is with a video I posted in the description. In this uh, video, you can hear Mamono, who was the main shot caller of Elevate. He's considered one of the best shot callers in the game. So what does he do? He tells a Zerg where he wants them and when, what to use and what to do, which direction to go and when to engage, when to mount and when to dismount. What he also does is hyping up his Zerg. Moral is, morale is very important, and definitely in a full loot PvP game. Even if people get regeared, even if they don't lose any money, it is important. What you can also see is that the person that is recording isn't always listening. That's because everyone in the Zerg has his role, and his role is to fend off flanks, jump on engages, and make sure his allies won't die that easily. Sometimes you have multiple shot cars, and the shot cars will communicate through TeamSpeak or another VoIP program. 
An example can be seen here. Good, good, good. We're, gonna we're gonna peel, we're gonna just run through them. Run through them, run through them, run through them. Now. Pull back run through them, we are coming on the north. northwest. The clapping is in northeast, you need to pull back northwest. Pull back northwest. Yeah, they're going northwest, they're going northwest. North Mika, how are you doing? Bro, how much Mika, how are you doing? Like five. Guys, 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 pull. Guys, 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 pull. Stay spread, guys, stay spread. Some distance from your allies. The spread. They're coming from the east. Use your defenses. Use your defenses. Yeah. Use rest spot if you can. Three. You're counter engaging in three. Two, Step up. One. Deep east. Deep east. This doesn't really influence you as a member to know this, but it's handy to know. As you know, everyone is different, and that means that every shot caller has its own style. In the description below, you can find the third video, which is a dominant shot call. Apart from the shot caller, there is also an answer on how you, as a member of the Zerg, should play in the Zerg. First of all, always listen to your shot caller, but use common sense. If the shot caller says to retreat and get out, he says, for example, get out west, but from your perspective there are 30 people dismounted blocking that way, do not suicide and escape a different way. Positioning wise, you should keep this formation. It's tanks in the front. The healers on the back, RDPS on the sides, and melee DPS at the sides as well. Or this formation. It's very similar, but it gives some more nuance. I'm not the author of these drawings, and since there are no author listed, I can sadly not give credit. Next to positioning, always keep your E ability for the shot caller. I can't stress this enough. Do not use your E whenever you feel like it. Use it when the shot caller calls an engage for RDPS, MDPS, offensive healers, some supports and most tanks. Or disengage, supports, defensive healers and some tanks. Of course, use common sense. If you are engaging and do not see a good clump, feel free to keep your E. If you're a healer and do not see anyone needing heals, do not use your E. Unless you're an aggressive healer, then use your E preemptively. Same goes for any role really. Do not waste your E. Another very important thing is builds. CVZ builds are designed for CVZ. Let's look at the generic RDPS build, the Siege Bow. Here you can see the an average RDPS build. It consists of a Knight Helmet, Cleric Robe, Scholar Sandals, and Fort Sterling Cape or Martlock Cape. Let's dissect every item and what it does. The Knight Helmet. It increases your crowd control resistance and makes target immune to any displacement effects like pulls, knockbacks, or fears for 6 seconds. The spell affects you and up to 5 allies in a 4 meter radius. So what does this mean? This means that the enemy will have more trouble stopping you when this effect is active. There are more applications of the skill, but I just want to touch the surface. The Cleric Rope. Upon activation, if you take damage in the next 1.5 seconds, you get the Everlasting Spirit Shield. This shield makes you invincible and increases your damage and heal power by 30% for 3 seconds. You often use this while you take damage or as a way to amplify your damage. A nice thing to know is that if you activate your Clytocrobe and you press your E right behind, uh, after it and your R dissipates or it gets purged, that your amplified damage will still continue. Scholar Sounds increases your movement speed by 70% and makes you immune to movement impairing effects for up to 5 seconds. During the focus, you can't attack or cast spells, but you regain energy. This can be very useful to go through slowing abilities. However, you need to be careful since this can be interrupted. For Sterling Cape, Condition automatically activates when you get stunned, silenced, or rooted. Effect removes any movement impairing and debuffed effects from you doesn't remove damage over time spells. This is a passive ability and just gives you more survivability. Same with the Martlock Cape, which activates when you take damage and your health is below 25%. It increases your defense by 50% for 5 seconds. To really see why these items are good is knowing which abilities are popular in ZVZ. More on that later. 
To sum it up, weapons and abilities are picked for these Z builds because of their area of effect, AoE for short, or effects overall, purges or cleanses, and then abilities that counter these are also chosen for CVZ builds, like anti-movement impairment. Now the why. Ha! The why question. Well, you know, CVZ is fun, right? Right? Um, CVZ often have an objective. This objective can range from loot to hideout to territory to bragging rights. In most cases, it's season points and fun. Season points that can be achieved by the result of ZVZs consist of outposts, small scale ZVZ, castles, mid to large scale ZVZs, or territories, also mid to large scale ZVZ. Often some fights play a large role in the bigger picture. If you keep fighting for high nuts at for example 18 UTC at X place for 3 consecutive days, they will not expect you when you turn up at Y place to take something else. Or you can wipe out an enemy to make place for a potential ally or renter. The why question has many answers and or something not really present. Now, I've been a little vague, what can the objectives be? Here's a quick summation of territories, castles, outposts, hideouts, content, world boss, resource boss like aspects, elites or whatever they're called, or transport. Territories, castles, outposts are the most common ones because they are a reliable way to make season points. The guards of these structures are easy to defeat, making it not as much harder in case you're attacked by, um, by an enemy. Highlands are more long-term investments in attacks, since they will prevent your ally to regear from uh, future defiance or damage their morale. I've personally seen guilds and alliances get severely damaged just because they lose highlands. Highlands are often people's homes and safe havens. Content is the community's way of saying it's for fun. They won't fight for any objective whatsoever. They will s just see each other, see each other's numbers, and try to force a fight. The world boss, resource boss, and transport are less common, but it's very normal for guilds or alliances to mass up zergs just to protect whatever they're doing. Now the when question. The when question depends on what objective we're talking about. Let's start talking about Black Sun. The attack of a territory starts with the declaration of the attack. Every zone where a hideout can be put in has a prime time. This prime time is 4 hours long and starts at 12, 15, 18, 21, 00, 00 03 or 0, 05 UTC. When an attack is declared, the attack will happen at the start of the next prime time. More info on the wiki. On the official Albion wiki, sorry. Castles happen every 6 hours, starting with 12 UTC. Outposts happen every 3 hours, starting with 12 UTC. Outposts and castles can be taken by anyone at any time. It just requires you to kill the AI guards. Highlights are a bit more complex. To put it simple, if the highlights is getting set up, anyone can attack it during the first 20 minutes of the prime time. If it's fully built, it needs to have an attack declared first, and a defense point can be chipped off every day after that, the start of the prime time of the next day. More info on the wiki. World boss is every 2 hours on every odd number hour, and resource bosses plus transports are random. Uh, if we're talking about stuff outside the black zone, the bandit event is random. We know that it's every four to six hours, but we can never say for sure that it will happen. Then the next topic is combat. We went over the important surface questions. Now it's time for in more depth dissections of the actual ZVZ combat. ZVZ Comet has a few different styles. The most common one is the Engage and Disengage style. One side will engage, burn all cooldowns and disengage afterwards. The other side will counter engage while the first group is disengaging. After they disengage, it's a Mexican standoff until the first side has its cooldowns back. The second less common but still present, mostly in smaller scale ZVZ, is the Brawl. Brawling is when both sides are constantly poking and fighting. Engages will still happen, but less intense and dramatic. Brawling often results in a slaughter on both sides. Let's now talk about commonly used important CVZ weapons with their abilities. Basically, weapons and abilities everyone should know about. 
First off, the Locus and the One-Handed Arcane. This is the Motivating Cleanse ability. It's a W slot ability that you will see on pretty much any Arcane stuff. It is casted on an ally and removes any movement impairing and debuff effects for up to 5 allies. It also gives 40% movement speed boost for all the allies affected. It does not remove damage over time effect spells. This is the one-handed arcane staff special ability, E-slot. The purple ball it shoots out will explode on impact with the first enemy it hits. It will purge, silence and damage all people in range of the small explosion. This staff and ability is mostly used to hold off flanks. It will purge buffs, so that means boot spells and damage amplifiers like Royal Hoods and Cleric Rope. It also silences, so the enemy will have trouble getting out as fast as they come in, making them vulnerable to an engage. This is the Locus, the Malevolent Locus, or just Locus for short. Uh, special ability, also the E-slot. It is an uninterruptible cast which creates a dome. The dome increases in size over time. The dome removes all negative effects from allies while also increasing the resistances of all allies in the dome. This ability will make or break fight. It is the most impactful weapon of all weapons. A locus impact won't be that obvious until you focus on when and what it did in the fight. Next off, the Life Curse. This is the Life Curse Staff or Life Curse Special Ability on the E slot. It is an uninterruptible cast like Locus, but has a very small area of effect compared to Locus. The area purges all positive effects from enemies. Every time an enemy gets hit by the blades, they also get a damage output reduction. This is a very important ability, it can remove all the night helmet buffs of the enemy and make it so that your clump actually gets made. Next up, the Growth Keeper. This is the Inertia Ring ability, which is the last unlockable uh, of the W slot of the Hammer Tree. This ring is often referred to as Onion Ring or Piss Ring. This ring slows all enemies for 90%. Uh, that are in the yellow part of the ring. This ability is often used to prevent an engage or make it as hard as possible for the opponent to get a successful engage. The ring can be countered by using the Focus Run ability which is found on the Scholar Sandals. Ideally you would want multiple of these rings next to each other, slightly overlapping and used when the front line just passed uh, your front line. This will make a gap between the opponent's front line and back line, either forcing the back line to stop their engage or get in a sticky situation. The front line is forced to go in deep and hope for the back line to reach or go back early. Be careful though, these abilities can be baited. What sometimes happens is that only a part of the Zerg will engage to try to force out these rings. When they get used, they wait until they disappear and then engage. This is the Growth Keepers, or wildly known as the Poglog, signature ability. The signature ability makes you jump after a short delay and will stun and damage all enemies in the center of your impact. This weapon and ability combined with the Inertia Ring is a very solid combo for a disruption weapon. Many Zergs use this weapon and ability purely defensively, jumping on enemy DPS that try to engage. However, this weapon also has seen as uh, aggressive use and is also a favorite for some shot cars because of its range and impact. This signature ability is countered quote unquote, by Night Helmet. The Night Helmet's ability will reduce the duration of the stun. This is the Camelon. This is the signature ability of the Camelon. It sends out a small red object that will latch on the first target that it collides with. After it collides, it will make a large red circle and after a brief moment, everything in that circle will get pulled to the middle of this red circle. Also known as the person the shockwave latched onto. This ability is one of the major club makers in ZVZ. It is very important that if you get Camelot, do not walk into your one allies. I made a, a little paint um, thingy, so like walk away from your allies, don't walk into them. But Warder, won't that mean I die and all the others live? I don't want to die. First of all, don't be selfish. It's better to sacrifice a few for the many. Second of all, if they engage on you alone, they will almost instantly lose the fight. It is dumb and inefficient to engage on a single target. 
the worst that can happen to you is that they use Q's and W's to chip you down. But in an ideal scenario, a frontline healer will come to your aid. It's also possible that they start clomping to get closer to you, making it even better for us. This ability is countered by the Knight Helmet. The Knight Helmet's ability will make it so that the pull does not drag you to the center. In case you are in range of the pull, simply walk out or use your Knight Helmet. This is the Krill Seeker. Uh, it makes a long yellow line that roots everyone in its place. The yellow line lasts for a moment and will still root all enemies that walk in it. The ability can be recast but will double its cooldown to make a secondary line which does the same thing. As you can see from the pictures, this ability has a high skill expression and can prevent engages or make engages very hard. The person with this weapon will often use it defensively and will prevent the enemy from engaging, similar to the Grove Keeper. However, I personally enjoy playing it aggressively because it has a long range and high skill expression and it makes it a great tool for catching. This ability is countered by cleanses, mostly, which can be found on the Arcane, as staffs and the Mercenary Hood. However, since it ignores crowd control resistance and duration modifiers, the Knight Helmet does not help against this ability. Next up, the Judicator Armor. This is the signature ability of the Judicator Armor, the R slot. This uh, creates a dome that increases the resistances and healing received. The green outline on the border of the dome indicates if it's an ally jury or not. There is nothing much to say without dragging this out. Use it to get bad resets, use it before allies are dying, use it in the front. Next up is the Icicle. This is the Icicle signature ability, E slot. It creates a large field that deals damage and most importantly slows you by 75% for 3 seconds. The area itself lasts for 5 seconds. This ability is also used to hold up flanks but also has seen some play in disrupting engages or disengages. If I recall correctly, this ability is countered by the Scholar Sands. Knight helmets have no effect. Next up, the Knight Armor. This is the signature ability of the Knight Armor, the R slot. This wind wall will bounce you back when you want to walk through it. The user needs to keep casting it for as long as he wants the wall to last. For every enemy that gets hit, the user casting the wind wall will receive resistances. This wind wall is mostly used as disengage ability and is countered by the Knight Helmet. When you have the Knight Helmet effect active, you can just walk through it. Next up, the Damnation. This is the signature ability of the Damnation, E slot. This ability will pierce, reduce resistances, and apply damage over time effect on everyone that is hit. The casting time is long, however, this is solved by using a scholar rope, making the cast time relatively short. This ability does not stack and can't be countered besides interrupting the caster. Once the effect is applied, you can't do anything to counter it. Next up, the Fallen Snuff. Also, E slot. After a brief cast, it will create a green circle. Once the circle in the middle grows and touches the outer circle, it will heal and cleanse up to 10 allies that are in the larger circle. This ability can be used aggressively, which is hard, but is also the best use of the ability, but should be also be used defensively to make sure people are healthy fast. The Wild Staff. It's the Wild Staff signature ability, E slot as well. It will create a large circle that will heal up to 10 allies standing in it for a period of time. This ability is generally used as backline healing, but also gets some use when your allies are disengaging and walking through the same choke. Next chapter is ZVZ Systems. Alien Online has some systems that play a role in ZVZ. We'll start with the Disarray system. A more in-depth way to learn about this is to simply read the wiki. The TLDR version, too long didn't read, is more allies means less stronger the individual is. This race starts at 26 players, giving a 1% debuff on bonus damage on enemy players, on bonus defense versus enemy players, and CC duration on enemy players and received healing. Second important system is Cluster Q. This one of the systems that most people hate and will complain about. 
During my playtime, I know of three reworks of the system. With that being said, the most updated version can be found on the wiki. The TLDR version is basically that once 350 people are in a zone, the zone gets cluster queued. This means that the zone is locked and low IP players in the zone will get kicked out and higher IP players out of the zone will have the chance to queue in the zone. It's also possible to skip the cluster and hop zones. If I recall correctly, the attacker and defender of the zone, if there is a territory attack, attack present, has priority and people in queue will determine what the ratio of players is in the zone. On top of that, people in queue also add in the disarray buff, the debuff of the cluster queued zone. Third system is a blob system. You surely have seen these red circles or other colors in the royal continent. They appear starting from more than 10 people being near each other. Um, there isn't a lot of documentation about it, just know that we refer to them in tiers. I know that the tier 1 blob starts from 11 people and tier 2 blob appears from 21 people. This is the end. Uh, I hope this was insightful. If you have any questions or remarks, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, or the grip hashtag 1263 on Discord or leave a comment here check them every once in a while. I also keep this uh, video up as uh, like up to date as much as possible. If you want more I'll be making a introduction guide to shot calling like the video on it soon and I'll link it in the description as well. Feel free to use any part of this video as long as you give me credits. Um, if you want to join my discord or check out my twitch streams you can find those in the description as well. That will be it for me. See ya!